Bonjour et bienvenue à tous avec le micro ça marche mieux, merci de nous rejoindre pour cette nouvelle session de notre salon Bien vivre aux états unis 2022, on est ensemble depuis le début de la semaine, vous nous avez sans doute déjà suivi pour parler de tous les sujets qui intéressent à la fois l'installation aux états unis mais aussi la vie aux états unis lorsqu'on est français, expatrié ou immigré selon le mot que l'on veut choisir. Alors on a la chance pour aujourd'hui d'avoir deux experts de qui vont nous parler d'entreprendre aux États-Unis, alors d'un point de vue euh, juridique, puisqu'ils sont tous les deux avocats, euh, Ale, Ale, Alexandre leturges koyanis et Daniel Koberger, qui vont nous rejoindre euh, dans quelques secondes euh, pour parler euh, de, ces, euh, sujets, euh, de, euh, de ces sujets, évidemment, de l'entreprise aux états unis euh, N'hésitez pas, comme d'habitude, à poser vos questions. Vous nous suivez sur Facebook, sur YouTube, sur le site euh, dédié de French Morning et euh, vous pouvez poser vos questions en commentaire, euh, bien entendu. Euh, J'accueille maintenant tout de suite nos deux invités, nos deux experts qui vont euh, nous rejoindre et euh, pour pouvoir vous expliquer, vous donner... Euh, leurs euh, leur conseils pour une bonne implantation euh, aux états unis euh, Alex, Alexandre et Daniel, merci à tous les deux d'être là. On va commencer euh, dans quelques secondes, juste après euh, cette petite, euh, ce petit message publicitaire de notre sponsor de ce salon, sans lequel, bien sûr, rien ne serait possible. À tout de suite Et merci à eux, merci à tous les deux euh, d'être là pour euh, cette euh, heure de, euh, de discussion sur le sujet euh, de l'entreprise aux États-Unis, d'entreprendre aux États-Unis. Alors, euh, Alexandre, on va commencer euh, avec vous pour euh, parler euh, plus euh, assez généralement de comment on commence une entreprise aux États-Unis, comment on la structure. On va parler aussi euh, fiscalité. Puis, on parlera dans la deuxième partie avec euh, Daniel de propriété intellectuelle, de protection, contrat de licence, etc. Euh, vous, nous allons rentrer dans les détails. Encore une fois, le plus important, c'est qu'on puisse répondre à toutes vos questions. Donc, n'hésitez pas, même si c'est des sujets qu'on a plus ou moins abordés dans la, dans la présentation, n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions. On les reprendra au fur et à mesure et à la fin de cette, de cette présentation. C'est évidemment le but, c'est qu'on soit le plus interactif possible pour pouvoir répondre à toutes vos questions. Et puis, on, on diffusera tout au long de cette séance les QR codes qui vous permettront de contacter nos deux experts. Et, et évidemment, si vous êtes inscrit, vous recevrez aussi un email avec leur contact pour pouvoir continuer la discussion. Voilà pour l'état des lieux. Merci encore, Alexandre. Je vais te passer la parole pour commencer cette présentation nous accueillir pour ce, ce, cette belle présentation. Um, on est ravis d'être ici aujourd'hui, um, ce matin ici à New York, uh, et pour Daniel à Munich, en Allemagne. Hi Daniel. Um, so, uh, we're going to continue that in English. Uh, J'ai oublié de le mentionner en, dans l'introduction uh, qu'effectivement, cette conférence aura lieu en anglais, mais uh, si vous nous suivez, vous êtes uh, tous uh, à l'aise en anglais, évidemment, uh, mais uh, notamment pour Daniel, on va, on va parler uh, en anglais, uh, et puis ce sont des, des termes et des, des concepts que de toute façon, si vous êtes ou avez l'intention de vous installer aux états unis vous allez uh, devoir les connaître en anglais. Donc, uh, cette conférence est effectivement en anglais, ce qui est une exception pour cette semaine. <rire> Yes, you, you, will, you will know those terms like terminology or you, you will um, get familiar like with it. Um, so we are KBL Roche, um, Daniela and myself, um, 
started this uh, joint venture um, a year ago now. I mean, we, we've been working together for, for a long time now. Um, so I specialize in, uh, in um, that's Daniel, intellectual property. I do in international tax. Uh, and Daniel will like uh, do a quick note on what he does, and then I'm, I follow with uh, the presentation of the firm, and I will start the presentation. Please, Daniel. Uh, hey everyone, um, apologies for my uh, terrible French. Um, I will start with English right away. Um, my name is Daniel Koberger. I'm a German U.S. licensed attorney. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here for the second time. Uh, I specialize myself in um, intellectual property and um, digital entertainment, licensing agreements and what have you. Um, formed my company, my own company four years ago, or maybe nearly now five years ago. Um, and Alex and I have been working together ever since. And um, we finally made the big jump at the beginning of 222, um, kind of to close the pandemic. So again, um, I'll give the rest to Alex until you see me again. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel. So our firm is not only like uh, the two person you see on this screen, um, but it's also like a, a network of professionals. Um, so we're working with, uh, and actually we mentioned them here on, on this PowerPoint, um, we're working with um, uh, experts in different fields um, from uh, securities, securities law, um, to startups, uh, immigration law, um, uh, expert comptable and also CPAs here in the US, um, not to mention um, intellectual property and uh, music law, which is uh, very specialized. And uh, we're very extremely happy and proud um, of this network that we're building every day. So we are able to, to provide or um, uh, to put this network to work uh, for our clients. Um, for them to, to succeed in their uh, endeavors here in the US. So what we do technically uh, and more precisely here in the US and for our clients, um, tax law, uh, we do tax planning, um, whether for your family or your business. Uh, we also do uh, corporate law, we take care of trademark and copyrights, uh, licensing agreements, as Daniel mentioned, uh, mergers acquisitions, um, we uh, also take care of uh, tax um, uh, controversies, uh, whether with state or uh, with the IRS, which is the uh, Internal uh, Revenue Service, uh, the United States uh, Tax Administration. Uh, and we also have, uh, we can also get involved in uh, real estate uh, deals here in New York uh, through. Uh, a real estate broker's license uh, that the firm acquired a year and a half ago. Um, so I'm going to start this presentation basically to tell you like what you should consider uh, before coming to the US or ju just basically before like starting anything uh, to make money here in the US. I would say maybe we start with the business plan, right? Um, what are your objectives here in the U.S., what type of business and uh, what would be uh, successful here in the, in, in the United States, whether uh, you're considering New York, New York City, could be Florida, Miami, um, not to mention like Los Angeles or San Francisco for some people could be could be a good a good good option. Um, maybe you will bring uh, maybe you already have your um, your company in 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 France, for instance, or in Europe and you, you might want to, to get your employees um, here with you in your workforce, bring your workforce here in the US. Um, you have the option to keep uh, your, a, a contract, a foreign contract, technically a, a French contract for your workers, your employees, or maybe you will like think about a local contract uh, to better comply with local laws and regulations. Um, then there is a visa, visa consideration to have. Um, most, like some people have uh, the, um, that sorted already, which is a blessing, I would say. Um, but for most people, um, a work visa would be required uh, even before like, coming to the US. Um, so it's something to plan ahead a little bit. Um, and this will define also your project. 
uh, and your business here in the US. And perhaps also you will think about bringing your family um, or your, your employees' family here in the US. And then uh, there will be like many questions behind that and around it. Um, does uh, the person have um, children and perhaps um, they need to go to school here in the US? So really something to plan ahead, as you can imagine, um, from um, a caregiver for the, uh, for the child um, to school, uh, what type of school programs, um, something to plan ahead, definitely. And also like um, your spouse might, um, might want to come with you uh, here in the US. Uh, what, and then what will your spouse do uh, in the US? Um, perhaps the same um, as in France, but perhaps also something different. It's, it's not uncommon that um, spouse um, that come here in the US decide to just um, start their own business. Uh, they're like, oh my God, this is something I would like to do, something I, um, like some people are very interested in photography, for instance, they start their own business. They become like photographer here in the US. Um, you never know, something to plan. Um, when to start planning? Um, I would say plan ahead uh, because this will also help you to like um, uh, see all the options you have and adjust your um, uh, adjust your your, um, um, your 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 plans. And we advise like our clients to start planning like eighteen to sixteen months in advance. Um, maybe maybe also because like let's say just for a visa nowadays uh, it takes like about a year and even more to uh, from start to to finish so um plan plan ahead please um and i would say also where to start your journey in the us um there are le legal consideration uh on where you will like live in the us uh from tax to um from ta tax perspectives, um, corporate perspectives uh, for your business, but also I would say it's about the lifestyle of where you're gonna live in the US. Um, your, your life will be uh, different if you're living in the West Coast or in the East Coast. Um, for the, the, the seasons are different, people are different, the, uh, the mentalities are different, the, the business opportunities will be also like widely different and state laws and regulations will also differ and um, some states might might fit better your projects than others um i would I, I wanted to talk a little bit about international tax in international like laws in general um because this is something like we we hear like about but we're not, not sure like if we we would deal with um, tax with uh, tax treaties or international law at all, and when this should apply to when this this start to when you should start to think about uh, international law. Well, I would say it's any time you in between you are in between two different countries or more multiple countries, but. As a little background, like I'm going to talk about tax treaties, they are mainly like bilateral um, treaties, which means between two countries. Um, let's say France and United States, they do have a tax treaty, uh, and this tax treaty usually helps uh, mitigate the the tax burden on on people. Um, how it works is like usually. Um, let's say you have income from france um you have um real estate income you 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 own a parisian apartment that you rent and you get like fifteen thousand dollars a year from it and you will like report that income in france um and in the us if you become a tax resident in the us then you will have to report your worldwide income in the us i will i come i go back to to that in in, in a couple of minutes on what a worldwide income uh, reporting in the US is. Um, but let's say you also report your French income in the, in the United States um, and you will also like pay taxes on that. 
you're like, wait, wait a minute, I'm going to be double taxed on that $15,000 income? Yes. Um, and the tax treaty is here to, um, um, to suppress, I would say, to, um, to make sure that the double taxation um, will not be a burden to you. Um, there are like many mechanisms to um, offset the uh, the U.S. tax, and one of it is uh, it's called um, a foreign tax credit. The tax you pay in France would be uh, deducted from the tax that is computed here in the United States. Um, some other treaties, uh, international conventions will take care of um, gifts and estate. Um, and even like um, social security that uh, about 25 countries have uh, what, the, what we call a totalization agreement with the United States, which means that France is part of it, which means that if you still paying uh, social security um, in France, then you will be exempt of paying social security tax here in the United States. Um, it's not a general rule, but um, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, and and it's something you you should talk with um, with your employer or uh, your tax advisor. Um, uh, also know that there are uh, international conventions where countries exchange information uh, about individuals, uh, mainly uh, bank information and financial uh, information. Um, something they do every day. Uh, so it's hard to hide uh, income and assets um, because uh, tax administrations like talk to each other. Um, and what happened when there is no tax treaty? Well, they, there might be like a double tax and that, that happened uh, with some, um, some countries where the United States like didn't sign uh, a, a tax treaty. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Usually we... Um, we recommend our clients to relocate um, and uh, to move their assets from those countries um, because uh, the, the tax burden would be uh, would be too heavy. Um, and if we need to, uh, if there are no answers in those uh, treaties, and if the law is like really silent uh, on a specific issue, uh, we we enter into. Uh, a negotiation between uh, the uh, the administrations um, at stake, and we we try to find um, a, a resolution for for the conflict that that is pending. How to decide on structuring business um, here in the United States? Well, there are so many ways to do business. Um, you can be a sole proprietor, which means it's you and your client, you facing your client. Um, uh, there's no not much to do besides like starting the business um, and make sure you have the the, the work visa uh, that works for that. Um, you can uh, create a limited liability company, uh, LLC, um, or corporation. Um, they are both like regulated by state law. Um, we can find like common common um, common regulations about uh, forming this type of companies, um, but state law applies for that. Um, it, we should understand also that um, the, an LLC, for instance, and sole proprietor, obviously. Um, all the money you make and all the expense would be uh, directly uh, flowing through you um, as a business owner. Let's say you are an LLC sole member. It's only you uh, on the LLC. Um, by default, um, for tax purposes, this would be treated as a, a disregarded entity, which means that everything, the entity is not paying taxes. Um, per se, you, you will be taxed on behalf of the company. So um, on what we call a Schedule C, uh, which is a specific form on your tax return in the US, you will, we will report everything the LLC makes during the year. Um, we could like deal also with um, tax elections, which means that 
we could um there is a way to um to change the tax treatment of an llc um it could be treated as a corporation or even as a small corporation like both have like some like advantages um and also burden uh, administrative burden because it's heavier obviously to uh there's the compliance it's, it's bigger and there's more things to think about and and to do and the uh the tax return would be uh, also like uh more complex um but something you can do that that's part of the tax planning and uh and that that also should be uh considered with your um with the, your business goals and um the growth you want to give to your business um a partnership would be uh also something you would consider if you are like more than one person on the business um and obviously something to structure because uh the liability on a business uh will be different when you have more than one person uh from decision making to uh to tax liability also um how to start your business is um it's up to you whether you start with an llc um or you start directly with a corporation um it's just about like what what are the rights the proper step to to begin with um it all all start with the state registration and the registration with uh the tax department in the state you're in um something to do systematically um there are many corporate documents to work uh to work around and to that that will help you to start the business so that's something um that's something we, we discussed with you um at the very beginning um how about compliance um this is very important to understand that starting a business is not only um taking care of your clients um and making like sales it's also um taking care of your bookkeeping making sure your financials uh, are squared up uh, making sure you are working with the right people uh, for your business compliance uh, being aware that you might have to collect sales tax which is the equivalent of the the VAT um, in French is TVA um, you would be surprised that some states will require you to collect the sales the sales tax on some uh, services uh, and products uh, and some other states won't um so and you you might you might you might see like where i'm going with that um we're 50 different states in the united states and um uh the the tax compliance is mm, a, a, an humongous like uh, a maze i would say um because if it really depends like how many transactions and how much money you make in a specific state uh where your uh clients customers are based um this this will uh in some cases uh make you uh liable for uh sales tax in a specific state and that, that will then require you to register with that state again uh with the the state and also the tax department and make sure you comply with uh the tax reporting usually uh every quarter sometimes every month um so you see that the burden is like like growing here um and it's it's also all about understanding like when uh and force and trying to foresee when this uh this app this happens right because you want to be on top of your game here uh you don't want to wait the the, the state tax department to uh to knock at your door and, and tell you tells you and tell you that um that you're liable for taxes that you didn't know about um and also like business compliance is also like when you hire people uh if you hire an employee uh, out of your home state uh you will also have to comply with uh with different rules and regulations uh not necessarily with the tax department but then that would be the labor department uh and some tax consequences will uh 
will follow that. Um, and overall, um, something I would I, I always um, re remind our clients because they tend to forget. Uh, once you register with a state, a specific state, and you could have multiple registrations uh, in different states, you, you you're usually uh, due for an annual or biennial report uh, with those states. It's something where like you also pay a minimal fee um, usually. It's something uh, you should uh, take care of uh, on a regular basis um, in order to remain compliant. Uh, and that's, I think, the, the favorite question for, uh, for most of uh, my clients or all clients is like, when do you stop paying uh, tax in the United States? Um, I think the, the best way to start with that um, that question is like um, talking about the substantial presence test. Um, it's where you, you you have heard about it. Like um, when you when you when we say that if you're a, like more than six months in the United States, um, you will like become a U.S. tax resident and start paying tax in the U.S. Well, this is true. But also, like the the test itself is is a, a tiny bit more complex. So here's the rule: how to compute those days. Uh, we're talking about 183 days, but over a specific period. But to start with, you you become a U.S. tax resident if uh, the current year you spend more than 31 days in the United States plus 183 days over the past three years. And to add like those days to do the math is you take all the days you spent in the United States that, that year, the, the current year. Then you take a third of the days you spent in the United States the prior year, and you take a sixth of the days you spent in the United States two day two years prior. And if that those days total um, 183 days or more plus 31 days the current year, then you become a tax resident. Um, there are like many ways to, to go around that test, um, mainly for um, mainly through um, the tax treaties um, that will also like help you not to become a US tax resident. Some people are looking to avoid this situation where they become a tax resident because uh, and this is where it, 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 it's hard to understand. Like um, once you become a US tax resident, you, you will have to report your worldwide income. Like, any type of money from interest, dividend, uh, passive income, uh, money you make from um, from being um, involved in board of directors uh, in, in different companies um, outside of the United States, um, money from securities, money from sales of um, properties, this will need to be reported here in the United States. No matter where you report that income first, um, you th this will have to, to appear on your tax return here in the, in the United States. So yes, we as we discussed before, we we will be able to use uh, the tax treaty to, to lower the tax burden here in the United States. But sometimes um, the tax credit is not enough. And sometimes the, the U.S. tax is higher than the tax you paid abroad. Um, and you will still have to pay um, some tax on uh, an, an I item of income that you got like outside of the United States. So some people try not to be U.S. tax reason for that reason um, and will like just file as a non-resident in the United States and only report their uh, United States uh, sourced income. There are like different type of tax. Um, 
we're talking here only for federal uh, because again like each state um they have their own uh, rules and regulations um about like it's we have like 50 states so we, we won't have time today to to go through uh, all of uh, the the laws and regulations that exist in the united states except for the the states that don't have um uh, personal income tax um in addition of like state and city tax that that may apply to you um we have two like big buckets like the general income uh which are part of it is uh, salary wages uh, business income we're talking about short-term capital gain ordinary dividends interest and passive income um they are all taxed at the marginal rate uh at the federal level it's up to 37 percent um and well we have also like different type of income different categories uh which are qualified dividends um i also mentioned like long-term capital gain which are um both taxed at um up to 20 percent um not to mention this uh, passive income um tax um which is an additional 3.8 percent something to consider um and also know that the foreign income um that you you get out from outside the united states they all follow those categories um, um obviously like tax um, tax treaties might might change uh the way we treat those uh, categories in the united states so always something to look at uh when you uh you prepare your tax return or where when you're talking about this subject with your uh, tax advisor um i think i would finish this uh this part like talking about the different type of uh tax returns we're dealing with um the main or uh, personal income tax return which is 1040 um we have the one for partnerships uh, 1065 1020s for small corporation 1020 11, sorry 1120s for small corporation 1120 for corporations um some people need to deal with a trust and estate tax return 1041 um all those returns are like the main uh, categories um we, are, we attach like many um schedules and uh, additional statements uh, depending on um, your personal situations um, most people hire um, a tax advisor a tax preparer in the US tax preparer uh, need to be registered with the IRS internal revenue service um, in order to, to be able to help you with a tax return at the very end like some um, tax return might be filed like um, you can fight tax return on your own. Um, some so many softwares um, are available in the market. I would we will advise to um, to do that only if you have what we call a W two and some like ten ninety nines um, on your own. Um, then the W twos are um, like your like general pay stub for for the year that recap your your income and withholdings. Um, like above that, I would highly we would high, highly recommend you to uh, to to use a tax preparer uh, to avoid mistakes uh, in preparing your tax return. Um, so this is very short. I know it is a lot of uh, information in in like 20, 20 minutes. Um, I will pass the flow to Daniel, who is talking about how to raise money in the U.S. and many like other subjects like. Bread. <laughs> Uh, which I'm very excited for you to to hear about, Daniel. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, it was very instructive, um, and thank you for preparing the grounds for a little bit of uh, practical advice from a legal perspective on raising money in the U.S. and protecting very likely your most valuable asset, um, intellectual property. Um, just briefly, uh, for anyone who has joined uh, later on, um, my name is Daniel Koberger. I'm a German US licensed attorney, um, raised in Germany, born in the US, uh, law degree in both countries and admitted in both countries, uh, 
and have been doing business with Alex now for over five years. And we have our own law firm, KBO Roche, uh, since beginning of this year with offices in Paris, Munich and New York. Um, currently, I'm in Munich in my small office, uh, traveling back and forth most of the time. Now, that said, um, we're quite limited on time. Uh, I think we have something about 20 minutes left. Um, I want to give you a good feeling from a practical perspective. Um, I also want to give you some time at the end of the presentation. So to ask questions, I think you can do these in French or, or English. Um, Alex, of course, uh, is a bit better in French than I am um, for obvious reasons. Now, um, that said, I'm going to talk about raising money now. Um, I can't go into great detail for everything. I want you to be able to understand what are the instruments that you have? Um, how do you create your business? Um, so, you know, understanding what the investor is buying into and also understanding um, how an investor can buy into your company, talking about some uh, investment instruments and then talking about IP. So briefly before um, we start with any concrete legal details, what's the attraction of the U.S. market? Uh, the U.S. market has uh, traditionally, historically speaking, uh, high liquidity. Um, it's very investor friendly and has every businessman and individual in the U.S. has a high risk propensity. As I often say to my clients, it's uh, an American buys into an idea. They don't buy a product. In Europe, we buy into a longstanding culture, a functioning product. Um, the difference here is striking. It's the idea is very risk propense. Um, now, why is the U.S. very investor friendly? Um, well, it starts with um, actually at the beginning, the simplicity of the formation process. Now, Alex talked about a couple of options that you have when you want to form a business. Um, forming an LLC, forming a corporation is a simple uh, and quick process with uh, low costs involved. Um, the flexibility of the tax treatment, um, Alex talked about regarded and disregarded entity. Um, we can choose throughout the life of an entity how we want the entity to be taxed. So in particular, the simplicity of formation process uh, is striking. Um, what does that mean? Well, first of all, uh, you don't need minimum capital to form a corporation, to form an LLC. Um, you probably know from France uh, that uh, if you want to form um, a corporation, you need a ton of money as capital investment initially. Zero in the U.S. Now, of course, you have filing fees, attorney fees, and accountant fees, um, but you don't need minimum capital. Second, there uh, you can own an LLC or corporation as a foreigner. You don't even need to have set foot once in the U.S. The filing fees are really, really low, um, and it's a quick processing. Um, in New York, you, you need a couple of hundred bucks. Delaware, you need a couple of hundred bucks. We could go online right now and file a New York LLC or a corporation and be done in 15 minutes. Now, we probably would have made some mistakes and considering our business formation for purposes of our business plan. But nonetheless, um, it would be really simple and really quick. Um, so when you find and try to attract an investor in the U.S., uh, of course, understanding the benefits of the uh, U.S. market is great. Um, but you need to know what is the investor buying into. Now, of course, an investor is buying into you, um, into your product, into your vision, into your skill, your history, your reputation. But they are also buying into a business entity from a legal perspective you need to understand what that exactly is for investment so you can't invest into a sole proprietor so we're right now just considering a corporation versus an llc um, and there are three factors that i like to make sure that my clients understand um, when they're forming a business uh, um, deciding whether or not it is a corporation or an llc that they will be going with um, the first is uh, an LLC has a lot lower costs of formation. Now, bear in mind, we're not talking about capital investment. We're talking about formation costs, accounting fees, filing fees, and lawyer fees. With an LLC, you could you could get out of it with 500 bucks, maybe even less. No, usually, you're going to end up with one and a half or 2,000 US dollars in higher costs, but that's it. Um, with a corporation, you have a lot higher costs, and um, I would never advise bootstrapping formation of a um, corporation um, I would you would be looking at three four five or even more thousand US dollars for accountants uh, legal fees and um, the filing fees uh, the LLC um, however has less flexibility um, than a corporation uh, LLC is favorable if you're one or two founders and you're not looking for a lot of complex outside investment 
um, because an LLC only has uh, the owners of the company and a management. It's a very simple structure, leaves less options versus a corporation, which has a shareholder, a board and the management. Also, an LLC has no real um, flexibility to structure and options uh, to give away certain equity. A corporation, um, you can actually, at the end of the day, uh, uh, revalue your company over time by creating new equity. An LLC, if you want to attract an investor, you are selling your ownership in the company versus a corporation, which just can create new equity. Um, these are the core three differences is understanding the flexibility on the side of uh, stock and equity, understanding the flexibility or the not flexibility on the side of management and understanding the costs that you have initially, which are going to be a gatekeeper to forming a business. Now, these are the three factors. Another additional ancillary factor, which I left out, is where to form your business. So we usually say a simple rule for forming a business, you have 50 states. You go with the state where you're going to be located, unless there are specific other considerations to be made. And um, such considerations are for us usually a you don't even live in the U.S. yet, but you're forming already or you are forming the business for a very specific purpose. So be that your product is best in a certain state huh? or you're looking for investment outside investment. In. Given that this is the topic, I would always advise to go with Delaware. That's for a very simple reason, and I'm not making this up. This is not rocket science. You can read this anywhere. Um, it's for historical reasons um, uh, that at the end of the day, every lawyer, every accountant, the courts in Delaware, um, the administration in Delaware, everyone understands Delaware law as it pertains to corporate and investment laws. That makes it easier um, to actually just um, conduct this transaction. Now, um, aside from understanding what investors are buying into, um, it's also important to understand um, with what, what are the tools, what are the instruments uh, that an investor is going to use to buy into um, your entity? So there are, of course, a ton of options, um, and they will depend at the end of the day, who are your investors, what type of money are you looking for, and also in particular, which stage are you in, meaning are you forming your business? Are you early stage, you're still just developing your product with two co-founders? Or do you have 50 employees, 300 employees, a successful product in France, and you're moving to the US, you're looking for, I'm dropping some buzzwords, series A um, and so forth, investments. And these are considerations, of course, that will determine um, the instruments that you have. Nonetheless, I wanna focus right now on um, coming to the US, starting out with your business. yeah, um, And so I'm focusing on the small investment instruments here. Yeah? Um, so there, there are two very typical ones. There's one, there, these are convertible instruments, um, such as a SAFE, which you may have heard of before. Um, SAFE is short for Simple uh, Agreement for Future Equity. And the other one is a form of um, deferred compensation incentive options. Um, so the convertible instruments, are an investment instrument, which we do at the very early stage. We're looking at maybe $5,000 investment, maybe up to 100,000, maybe a bit more, but that's about the amount. Um, and that's for the reason that a convertible instrument is actually not a traditional investment to the extent that you're selling equity. You're actually in a very simple way, just getting a loan, but we're not getting a loan from a bank. We're getting a loan um, from someone who says, well, you know what, if you actually end up finding someone who buys into your company, I want my loan, my debt to convert to equity. Now, the benefit here is, of course, it's pretty simple up front. We're just doing a loan. We say in five years, you know, you have to pay back the money. Um, but we're also evading something really important in investment, which is the valuation point. If you have someone buy equity, you're valuing the company because that's the value of the company that you're buying. Um, with a loan, you're not doing that yet. You're pushing that out to a future event. So it allows you a lot of flexibility in the beginning. Um, you do have to, however, when you consider this instrument at an early stage, um, have to understand uh, two specific events. Um, the one is, is when does your loan convert? Yeah? And B, um, what's the discount that you're giving that um, 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 the creditor of yours? Um, what I mean with discount is, well, they're taking a certain risk by giving you a loan. Um, because 
if your company fails, no one is repaying them their loan. Um, so they're buying into that future upside. Uh, so they should get a discount versus the people that buy in when there is actually value there. So this is a classic one that everyone needs to know, a safe, the um, a simple agreement for future equity is a really simple agreement. You can download it. Um, it's a plug and play document yeah? um, that will give you a head start when you start your business. Now, the other one that I want to talk about is deferred compensation, incentive plans, options. So the one is restricted stock. This is stock that you give to your co-founders, that you give to other high level executives. When you want that they have skin in the game, you give them equity, but you're not giving them full equity, hence the term restricted. You're giving them equity that has a certain restriction as to their transferability, and most importantly, the right of the company to repurchase. That means that for a certain period of time, um, while the high-level executive owns equity in the company, for a certain period of time, they have the guillotine over them, threatening that the company can always repurchase. So until that moment in time that that repurchase right elapses, they don't have secured equity in the company. Um, the benefit of this uh, versus um, complex uh, investment strategy is it's very budget friendly. You're issuing the same type of stock that every other founder has in the company. You're just adding in simple a couple of restrictions often used in the US. Now, actually, I have to take a step back here um, and make sure that you understand that the restricted stock and the stock options that I'm talking about are technically possible with an LLC, but not advisable. What I'm talking about right now is usually something that you would only do for a corporation. Stock options are the other side of the coin to the restricted stock. Um, it's something you usually give to employees um, when you're looking to scale your business. Uh, but you don't yet have the money to pay all your employees, but you have a product that is worth riding to the horizon. Um, a stock option or an incentive option plan is um, the employee's right to purchase that stock in the future. So they don't have it yet. After a period of time, at a certain reduced price with a tax benefit. And simple, in three years, when they are allowed to buy the stock, um, they can buy it at the price when you gave them the option. So that's a big tax benefit for them. And what you have to understand when you give these stock options is, first of all, it requires an incentive plan. That means you have to disclose to your employees um, at a great extent how this plan works and how all of them can actually exercise their options. Um, it means you have to understand for your company and for your business plan, how do you want this to vest? What protections are you giving? What limitations are you giving to the employees on their options? Um, at the end of the day, um, it's a very sensible tool to scale your business um, after you've gone through the first couple of stages that I was addressing with convertible instruments and restricted stock. I, if anyone is interested after uh, this presentation, I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit about um, accredited investors um, or non-accredited investors in private placement as well as crowdfunding. Um, as other tools, but uh, given the time and that I want to also address uh, IP protection, I'm going to skip that uh, for this moment. Give me a second. Mm. All right. Um, I hope you're all still with me here. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing better than listening to a lawyer after listening to a lawyer talk about taxes. Um, and I hope I'm not speaking too quickly or um, unclearly. Um, so let us jump into IP. So intellectual property um, is in many businesses today, uh, their most valuable asset. If you start a business, that's all you technically own is your idea and the folks that contribute to it with content in the beginning. You have nothing else. Um, maybe you have a prototype, but the value in the prototype lies in its intellectual value. So you have to understand when you come to the U.S. that um, although uh, we have similar concepts in the U.S., France to Germany also have similar concepts, intellectual property are territorial rights. 
just because you have a copyright in France, just because you have a trademark or a patent in France or in Europe, means nothing to the US initially. Um, you have to get your own rights in that country. So what, what are these rights? Well, I'm going to be specifically talking about trademark and copyright um, and the differences and the benefits in the US. Um, but there are also patents, trade secrets, right of publicity, and so forth. The last three patents, trade, se trade secrets, and right of publicity, I'm not going to address today. Um, trademark and copyright are, particularly when you start your business, the most pertinent uh, and the most easily attainable versus a patent. Now, um, the US uh, has a couple of um, benefits uh, towards um, the European countries, which is in the US, we have registration of copyright. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, we'll talk about what is a copyright and a trademark? When do you get it? Um, who gets it? What does it include? What rights does it give you? And also how you protect it. So um, what's a copyright? Well, a copyright is the expression of your idea. That's what the law says. Yeah? Um, it's not a function, not a method. What does that exactly mean? Well, um, that means that uh, there are uncountable stories that are stories of star-crossed lovers, yeah? uncountable Romeo and Juliet stories. Yeah? All of these individually will be protected because what is protected is the expression, how it is told, the specific story. Yeah? What is not protected is the idea of the star-crossed lovers. Um, uh, another favorite one of mine is uh, uh, Star Wars and Harry Potter are basically the same story. Um, but you can't protect that idea of this young gentleman being raised by his uncle uh, and then finding this old geezer who teaches him magic. Um, you can't protect that idea, but what you can protect is Harry Potter as an expression of that idea. Um, also, it is not a function and a method. Uh, so if you write a book about accounting, if you write a great software code, how to solve a problem, you're not going to get copyright protection on how to s the, the, the problem solution, the accounting method. You're going to get copyright protection on how the code is written, on the explanation that you're giving on the accounting method. So we're focusing on the expression. And the second important factor in the US, which is really, really important to understand is um, versus Europe, um, is you only get copyright protection once you've put it in writing, meaning on a photograph, on your hard drive, you have done something to fix it onto a tangible piece of property. And in the EU, you technically could just have the idea and tell someone about it and you get protection for that. What you don't need is registration. Um, although we'll talk about the benefits in a second. Uh, I see that we're running a bit out of time here. Um, I'm going to jump a bit uh, uh, and talk about the most important parts about copyright that I need all of you to massively understand. Uh, first one is um, who gets copyright? Well, generally it is the author. Uh, but, and that is the same in, in France as it is in the US. That the US has one specific difference. We call this the work made for hire doctrine. That means in the US, it's possible that the owner of a piece of artwork, a content that is made, software that is coded, and the author and the owner of it is not the person that did it, but the person that commissioned it. So this is a great change in the risk of insolvency in a transactional relationship is because the owner is not initially the author, but the owner is a person that is paid for it immediately. This difference, always please pay very specific attention to it. The other thing I want to address with copyright specifically is um, in the US, you have a benefit of registering. If you have valuable content, um, be it a book, be it artwork, be it specific code, um, you should register your copyright. Uh, in the US, what does that mean? That means a simple process where you upload your um, certain content that you've created. Um, you upload that with the copyright office in the US and the rights that it gives you is it gives you the right to sue federally on a federal level, and it in particular gives you the right to request statutory damages. Now, the difficulty here is with suing someone over use of your copyright is showing what damage you had. You have to show that because they've made this, you didn't get money elsewhere. Huh? So you've lost an opportunity. Proving loss of opportunity is really difficult. If you have statutory damages after you have registered your copyright, you can sue someone from based on a catalog 
on a multitude of what the damages state in that catalog. You don't have to show your damages to some extent. And the third thing I want you to understand after work made for hire and registration in the US is um, that if you have a copyright uh, protection, you have copyright protection in France, the US has to grant you the same type of protection that they would grant to someone in the US. You don't get your protection that you have in France. You get US protection, but the US has to grant that to you. Now, I'm jumping over a couple of topics and copyright. I want to jump right to trademark um, because there are a couple of things that you absolutely have to be aware of. First, however, let's, let's talk about what, what is actually trademark. So a trademark is your logo, your name, your slogan, anything that you are putting into close proximity at the point of sale to your goods and services. Yeah? So when you buy a cup of coffee, you see the Starbucks logo. When you buy a T-shirt, you see the Nike logo. So a certain logo, name, um, or other that is always in close proximity to the product at the point of sale. That is your trademark. Um, you get protection of this trademark the moment you actually start selling um, in the US. You do not, and this is really important, because you have a French trademark, get protection in the US. You only get protection for your trademark, and this is what I want everyone to write down, is once you actually start selling your product with that trademark in the US, or you actually registered your trademark. And that's the benefit of the registration, the same way you have that benefit in Europe, you get that benefit in the US as well, but you have to register it in the US or start selling. Um, for how long do you get that protection? Um, and this is something to note. This is the same in Europe, but it's just really important to note at the end of the day, your trademark protection is something that um, uh, exists because you use it. If you do not use your trademark, meaning you do not sell with the name attached to the product, you do not enforce against people that are infringing um, on your trademark, you do not... Um, uh, hand out licenses for other people that want to use it, you do not act on the market with your trademark, you will lose your trademark rights. Um, that's for the simple reason that, and this is to conclude this presentation, um, trademark is something that exists in the mind of the consumer. Um, it's their association between the brand and the product to mean person X is selling this. This association in their mind um, does not exist if you don't use your trademark. So. Um, I guess I conclude when you do business, make sure to use and enforce your trademark as much as you can. Now, um, I think this concludes um, my uh, par force uh, uh, journey through um, intellectual property and um, you know, legal considerations on the corporate and security level when you are looking for investment in the US. We're more than happy to answer questions at the end. Um, follow up by email. Give us a call. We'll sit down. We'll grab a beer or a glass of wine, um, whatever is your preferred uh, drink of choice. And it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Um, it's actually it has been already uh, an hour, so we won't have much time for for the questions. Uh, again, if you uh, if you have questions, and uh, feel free to reach out to uh, Alex and Daniel. Uh, they left the um, you, you've seen the contact. Uh, I can. Uh, uh, and, and again, you, if you registered, you you get them in the email uh, you receive with the replay. Uh, of today, so you'll be able to uh, to reach out to them. Uh, please do. Um, une question qui est arrivée en français. Alors je vais la je vais la poser en français et vous débrouillez avec après. Uh, C'est uh, finalement sur um, LLC versus Inc. Vous avez parlé, uh, vous en, vous avez abordé ça et uh, vous avez dit, je crois, notamment pour le euh, pour euh, le fundraising et, euh, et aussi euh, la question des, euh, euh, de, des incentives. C'est sans doute plus euh, efficace ou préférable de choisir une ing. Quelles sont, la question est, quelle, serait, quelle est la raison, notamment pour, un un, 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 quelqu'un qui arrive aux États-Unis de, de l'étranger, de créer une LLC versus Inc Quels sont les avantages une LLC, c'est la simplicité de la création euh, et le, le, le faible coût de la création d'une LLC. 
Euh, c'est une des principales raisons. Euh, à savoir que euh, rien n'est ancré, euh, rien n'est inscrit dans le marbre. Euh, une LLC peut toujours évoluer sur une corporation euh, et une LLC peut toujours, euh, comme Daniel l'a expliqué, euh, proposer des equity incentives. Ce n'est pas préférable puisque ça, ça crée quelques complications puisque certains États... Euh, non pas, euh, sont moins favorables à cette question euh, en revanche c'est toujours quelque chose de possible on peut toujours transférer une LLC d'un état à un autre et on peut toujours convertir une LLC en une autre forme euh, d'entité juridique uh, last question maybe uh, and I'll ask in English because it was asked in English um, is there a, a state Uh, how do you choose the state you want to register in or you want to be established in? Of course, everybody knows about Delaware and uh, people are sometimes obsessed with that. Uh, is there, when I, when I set up a company, like uh, let's say uh, uh, a, new, a new company for, for, an, for a French uh, uh, subsidiary, uh, is it, does it make sense to, uh, to register in Delaware? Daniel, you want to go with that one? I'd love to. Um, so, uh, first of all, I I believe in registering your company where you where you be domiciled as a business. Yeah, that's for a simple reason that um, you can go to the bank, you can go to the government, Department of State, and scream at them. Um, as 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 an example, yeah, you are close to everything. Yeah, you're close to the lawyers, you're close to the banks, you're close to investment in where you are domiciled as a business. That's always a massive benefit, unless, again, there is a certain reason not to do so. Now, um, there may be also reasons aside from being there as a business that such as um, your resources are there, yeah? um, be these actual um, tangible resources or intellectual resources, gas to uh, brains, yeah? Um, these resources may dictate your business to be there. Um, the reason not to go where you're actually tied to as a domicile or for other benefits um, is often investment. And that's why Delaware is such a smart move. And I know like, this is a broken record, yeah? But any corporate and securities lawyer, be they from Minnesota, uh, Mississippi, or Georgia or wherever, yeah? they're going to understand Delaware law. They can counsel you. And this is not a myth. This is actually true that that is a massive benefit because you don't have to weeks, spend weeks on looking for a lawyer, spend weeks on looking for the right accountant and so forth. If now I have a client that buys a company in uh, Michigan, huh? it's great that he buys our company in Michigan. I'm going to have to find a lawyer in Michigan. I'm going to have to start building that relationship. I'm going to have to start um, uh, finding out whether they're good or bad and so forth. And now suddenly four or five weeks are in. I've spent six hours that I can't bill. Point is here is at the end of the day, Delaware is a massive benefit, yeah, just for the logistical reasons. Um, nonetheless, uh, if you have a domicile and you're not looking for outside investment, I see no reason to go to Delaware. You are in uh, Charlottesville. Do that in Charlottesville, yeah. Not somewhere else. I hope that answers the question. And, uh, and also, maybe uh, sorry, go ahead. I may, yeah, um, something like we hear we hear like all the time. Um, Delaware is not a tax shelter. <laughs> I was I was going to say that exactly that. <laughs> It is um, not a tax shelter. You have go to Texas, go to Washington yeah, State. Right. Go like yeah. if you if you're looking for uh, tax incentives, uh, not Delaware. <laughs> Exactly. Because uh, again, if you have if you if if you have a, a Delaware company, but your business is in New York, you have clients in New York or whatever, then you are a New York state company and you pay taxes in the, in, in 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 New York. And it's yeah. the fact that your 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 company is registered in Delaware is not going to change anything. And and but you said it's more a question of 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 the environment and the ecosystem that exists. Uh, in terms of the lawyers, yes. in terms yes. of uh, uh, that might make sense, 100%. but it's not, not, ce n'est pas un paradis fiscal pour oui, répéter oui. les choses dans une langue qu'on va tous comprendre. Um, uh, we, we, we recommend, sorry, we recommend um, Cayman Island, maybe. 
Um, <laughs> if you're looking for the tax benefits. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> not with and us. We won't. <rire> It's not, not our purpose today. And, uh, merci beaucoup encore à tous les deux uh, d'avoir de, passé uh, cette heure avec nous et de nous avoir donné toutes ces explications. Merci à tous de nous avoir suivis. Uh, il nous reste encore une conférence dans cette uh, semaine. Là, ce sera pas business. On va parler de s'expatrier en couple uh, avec uh, des psychologues, avec des experts, des coachs qui vont uh, nous donner les conseils pour essayer de survivre à cette, uh, à cette uh, ce qui est parfois une épreuve et parfois une opportunité euh, donc euh, on se retrouve dans un tout petit peu moins d'une heure pour avec nos trois invités sur ce sujet là en attendant merci restez sur French Morning comme d'habitude merci à tous les deux à très bientôt merci beaucoup à bientôt merci